And I am going to introduce now Dr. Um, Richard Cooperwitz, president of Acufax, based in Washington State. They provide, he provides independent, quote, clear knowledge in the over-information age. He brings over 40 years' experience in the energy industry, offering special focus on appropriate hydrocarbon-based energy infrastructure design and operation in areas of unique population density or of an environmentally sensitive nature. He is a certified experienced process hazard and operability analysis team leader, skilled in process safety management, as well as a veteran emergency response leader on hydrocarbon releases. He has represented numerous parties concerning sensitive energy matters. The vast majority of these clients are public citizens or representatives of local city, county, state, or federal governmental agencies, or organizations that need highly specialized expertise regarding critical energy system matters. He's currently serving as a representative of the public on the federal level on the Technical Hazardous Liquid Pipeline Safety Standards Committee. Thank you, Rick, for joining us from Washington State. Thank, Thank you. you. Good evening. Talking about, let's just focus in on the AIM project. Um, it's going to, to, in the FERC application, it states various numbers, but basically it says the intent of the AIM project <clears throat> is to increase capacity by approximately 342,000 decatherms per day, which will take the Algonquin parallel pipeline systems um, total approximately 3 billion cubic feet a day of natural gas. That's a lot of gas, okay? Um, and uh, so you, you, you have to ask fair questions about the safety application. The AIM project, obviously, as many of you may already understand, is going to move gas from west to east. Uh, it's going to make modifications to five compressor stations that exist already. However, it is adding an additional 72,000 horsepower. That's a rather high number for such a small increase uh, in the stated capacity of the system. Uh, now, it doesn't mean they don't, they don't need this, this horsepower, but what it, it suggests to me is that at 3 billion cubic feet a day, they're starting to run into some serious bottlenecks on the Algonquin pipeline system. And so they're reaching the laws of diminishing return here. There are other changes regarding metering and regulation, regulator stations. But basically, the major issue on the map there is they're going to be replacing 26-inch in certain miles with 42-inch. And a 42-inch commands much respect. I'm not here to instill fear in anybody. It just says if you know what you're doing, you can operate a 42-inch quite safely, but you've got to respect it. and You've got to really stay ahead of the curve because if it were to rupture, it has a very large impact area. Basically, the modifications they're going to suggest to do in the AIM project, an important point for the company perspective, is they're trying to minimize expanding existing right-of-way. In fairness to them, they, I take that as they're trying to reduce the amount of property they would have to take, let's say, through eminent domain. By reducing it doesn't mean that they won't have to do that, take eminent domain, but there is some consciousness here in fairness to the company. The project appears to be driven by the Tennessee gas pipeline and the Millennium Pipeline expansions that have been recently either completed or announced. And basically what they're moving is Marcellus gas, shale gas, eastward, uh, and largely uh, at this level of uh, increase, uh, you're seeing that that's driven by mainly the demand for electrical power plant or cogeneration electric generation with some uh, distribution uh, or some uh, consumers shift, sh shifting gas or shifting from heating oil to natural gas. But the lion's share of the gas demand is probably going to be for electric power generation. Let me make a quick observation very quickly on the FERC process. It's important that folks understand that FERC is a siting agency. That's their primary jurisdiction regarding natural gas pipelines. They are not a pipeline safety agency. A lot of people get confused with this and so they spend a lot of time and effort making pipeline safety comments when basically FERC's going to say, look, we're not, that's not our jurisdiction. Another group, the, the, uh, what they call FEMSA, the federal agency responsible for establishing minimum pipeline safety regulations, that's their ju jurisdiction. And FERC will tend to dismiss pipeline safety concerns by saying if they comply with minimum federal pipeline safety regulations, that's good enough. However, FERC can deal with certain issues related to public safety 
which goes beyond pipeline safety. They can impose additional safety measures related to where they site a particular pipeline, you know, how far it is from certain critical infrastructure, various route, 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 uh, pipeline route alternatives, and, and more importantly, they can require that they comply with certain environmental conditions. So that's, you know, if you're looking at the expansion of the project, one of the major hooks that FERC will listen to, if you have environmental concerns, need to be very clear about that because that's one of the, that is one of their charters. FERC makes decisions of public convenience and necessity in improving natural gas pipelines. What I can tell you from what the FERC application for the AIM project is saying is the increased capacity is, is fully subscribed. That means to FERC, that's a very important hurdle. That means this gas has a consumer. Now, again, the bulk of it may be electric power generators, but that's a, a, a hurdle that FERC will check off. Now, also, while there may be environmental issues, uh, in fairness, in my years of uh, listening to FERC go back and forth, uh, while there may be specific isolated environmental issues, some of this will be offset by a big picture approach where, well, you know, we're switching from heating oil to fuel gas. So while you need to be very clear about your environmental concerns, also understand that FERC is looking at a bigger picture here as well. Again, it's very important to understand that the environmental construction impacts and routing impacts, are they really adequate for this particular project? That is your right, and you need to understand and present your concerns related to those issues to FERC in the application process. Let's talk about some leveraging pipeline uh, modification issues. The bulk of the, if you went back and looked at the map, uh, the bulk of approximately about 37 miles of existing pipeline is going to be modified to get this additional capacity. Uh, the majority of that is moving existing 26-inch pipe and replacing it in the existing right-of-way with a larger diameter 42-inch to remove a particular bottleneck in that segment of the pipeline Algonquin system. There are some additional loops that are going to be required in some neighboring uh, right-of-ways. Uh, though they're, it looks like they're minimizing those from my perspective. And there will be some additional right away for additional laterals that actually takes gas from the transmission system down to uh, the distribution companies, for example, and to some of the power companies. The major issue when you see the way they're making these modifications, the driving factor in these, uh, one of the driving factors in the design of a pipeline is the actual gas velocity. And only the pipeline operator knows those. And you can only receive that information through a CEII, Critical Energy Infrastructure Application, and then you can't disclose that information. I'm under certain CEII information disclosure restrictions on other projects, and I will respect those. So not with the Algonquin system, however. I want to point out, uh, while Algonquin has loop parallel lines, and in some cases three parallel lines further down their system, there is no maximum actual gas velocity spelled out in federal pipeline safety regulations. Go figure, all right? So there is a, a gap there in federal. On large diameter gas pipelines especially, while they can have very large impact areas upon their rupture, which is a big fracture of the pipeline based on certain types of threats to the pipeline, there are no siting restrictions in federal pipeline safety regulations, all right? And so when you start talking about it's too close to my house or whatever, I mean, you have a legitimate concern, but if you take that to FERC, they may, you know, they may look at it, but the reality is there's no law telling them to move this away from your house. So that's just something you need to be warned about. A new 42-inch pipeline that's going to operate at 850 uh, PSIG for a maximum allowable operating pressure, or MAOP, commands much respect, all right? If it ruptures, it, relieves much, it releases much tonnage in a form that can be extremely destructive. I don't say that to scare people. I just say that to tell people you don't treat this stuff lightly because if it fails, it can have a tremendous consequence. The blast impacts are fairly restricted by the nature of the blast. They're, they're, they, they can be very fatal if you're close, but they dissipate very quickly. Uh, the real impact that really determines the potential impact areas that are quite large for large diameter pipelines is the thermal radiation. And, and that's the thing that the, the federal regulations are trying to 
help the operators pay a little more attention to on lines that are in sensitive areas, known as high consequence areas. So the fundamental issue for a pipeline operator is don't rupture your gas transmission pipeline. That sounds easy, but it's harder to implement than, it's, than it may seem. The other thing is on gas transmission pipelines, there is no fence line, folks, as you're well aware of if you've got one near your a right away in your in near your area or close to you. Um, so there, there's basically free access, and so that's a complication the pipeline operator has to deal with. Talk about compressor stations uh, on safety perspectives uh, for a second. On federal transmission pipeline safety regulations, they address certain critical factors that all gas transmission pipeline uh, compressor stations must have, minimum standards. And those standards, while they won't necessarily prevent explosions or fires, substan substantially reduce the amount of tonnage. I don't want to make, make light of an explosion in a compressor station on a transmission line, but it's going to release gas many times less than a gas transmission pipeline rupture. And there are additional safety requirements imposed on that uh, compressor station that the operator has better control. Basically, a gas compressor station is a fenced-in facility. So the operator has, you know, he can restrict access and he can do certain other things. Now, let me be very careful here. There's a difference between a gas transmission pipeline compressor station and a gathering pipeline compressor station. Those uh, gathering pipeline or production facility compressor stations may not fall under federal regulation setting minimum standards. So uh, when Matthew talks about compressor stations, uh, there, there's going to be a distinction here that you want to draw between, the, you know, there can be very serious environmental issues for both, but the safety issues are, can be uh, significantly different. PHMSA addresses the minimum safety regulations for gas compressor stations, but they do not touch, have no jurisdiction for the environmental, addition, environmental conditions or requirements such, and additional issues such as noise or appearance. Okay, so the real issue for FERC is looking at as em emissions for compressor stations as an environmental condition, but if you try to say FEMSA, you need to deal with this as a safety agency, the Federal Pipeline Safety Agency, FEMSA will not touch that. They know it's not their jurisdiction. Okay, other concerns raise the facts. The issue's been raised about possible conflict with buried the 1,000 megawatt power line. There are two threats to the gas pipeline from such a nearby transmission pipeline. The science associated with stray current where the fields generated by the electric power line can actually rip steel off the pipeline. That's addressed in federal regulations and that science is well established. Uh, and, and so the pipeline operator should be able to demonstrate that they can protect against that. The second threat is an electrical ground fault where the transmission pipeline actually sh shorts out and tries to find that current seeking something underground. And a, you know, a buried pipeline is, a con is an electric conduit. That can cause damage to the pipeline. That kind of interference or interaction is rare. It can occur and can cause pipeline failure. Let me talk about the threat now, shift to the nuclear plant. Separation distance is the key to the 42 inch, should it, in the likely situation that it would rupture. The laws of thermodynamics define rupture impact area not the federal minimum regulations, all right? From what I've seen of the Indian Point plant, the nuclear facility is survivable should the gas pipeline rupture. Survivability and destruction are two different issues. Most likely the power plant would come down. There could be massive failure to structures. I think the issue that's of real concern to people is the fuel rod storage area. Could it survive such a facility? So I can't answer that question but that's an issue that someone might want to ask to be sure FERC sure ensures is covered. On recommendations for citizens action, citizen actions, write to FERC by all means if you have concerns, but I really advise you to stay clear and to the point and stay professional. Okay? They have a job to do. They are going to look at your input, but they'll probably pay more attention if it's put together in a professional, clear manner where your points are, are, are right to the point and understandable. You should require that 42 inch location, that there be su su sufficient distance that cannot seriously impact the nuclear sensitive facilities. Notice I didn't say the nuclear facility. There are certain issues like the fuel rods that are extremely sensitive 
And you have a, you know, you need to point out, you know, if you think there's certain areas there that need, you know, somebody needs to evaluate to be sure that they're properly evaluated in the likely case of a rupture, and that's a real concern, um, then address that and require, you know, ask for that to be evaluated. I can tell you the thing about distance. A lot of people tend to use this word. Distance is what we call a fail-safe. It never fails. It will always work. Now, the problem with moving the 42-inch further away from the plant is you may be imposing on other people. And I know there's other alternatives for crossing the river here. Uh, and, you know, you can ask FERC to look at that. Just be sensitive that FERC may have to say, okay, then we're going to have to take some property from somebody else. And that may be appropriate if it's a truly a safety issue regarding the Indian, if you believe there's environmental issues on your mind, be right to the point and ask for it to be sure that that's adequately and professionally covered. Anyway, I appreciate your time. I've probably gone a few minutes over. I apologize.